I'll give a kind of overview of uh, what we're doing at the Sim Lab. It's a progress report. So just only to situate you, that's, that's the Neuromatsin Lab. It's located in Ribeirão Preto, in the state of Sao Paulo, about 300 kilometers north of the state, of the capital, where we are now. This is the campus of the University of Sao Paulo there in Ribeirão Preto. There's a beautiful lake, lots of trees. It's a really beautiful campus. We have one of the best uh, research-oriented hospital, clinical hospitals in the country. Um, so it's a real good setting for do, to doing biological work uh, using say hard sciences, mathematics, physics, chemistry, and so on. So, and the Neuromatsin lab is a cluster with four compute nodes, each with eight Intel E52650 processors, 128 gigabytes of RAM and one hard drive with terabytes, and one server node with two Intel E52650 processors, 128 gigabyte of RAM, six HDs of one terabyte, and a Tesla K40 graphic accelerator with 12 gigabytes of RAM. So, of course, it's nothing compared to the computers that uh, Marcus has have presented to us in this morning, but uh, it's what we have. Uh, we'll probably have an upgrade soon with some funds available by FAPESP. But, of course, we'll always be lagging behind uh, the big projects that you have in Europe and Japan, as Marcus said. It's under operation since uh, April 2016, so just a little bit over two years. So what is the research plan that we have, uh, that we implemented uh, so far? So our ultimate goal is to model the experimental results obtained by Neuromat team and other groups as well, because we don't only, only to model Neuromat's results, but we want to model neuroscientific, neurobiological results. And most of these involve plasticity phenomena, which result for interactions between brain and environment, say like uh, when the brain is interacting with sequ sequences generated by context trees, or any type of sequence generated by the environment. So this is the ultimate goal, to study plasticity phenomena. But then to start with, at least in my point of view, it's important to understand um, the endogenous activity patterns produced by the brain. Of course, there's a whole philosophical question about whether the, the, there is such a thing as an isolated piece of brain. Of course, there's no isolated piece of brain. Even a cortical tissue is light, has some interaction. But anyway, uh, the system without uh, uh, receiving external input has some activity patterns there. So we want to understand those first, and then we'll be able to understand how it interacts with uh, external uh, stimuli provided by the environment. So I'll present the results so far, concerning only the, the, the third part of uh, what I said, the uh, spontaneous activity patterns in cortical network models. So the spontaneous activity patterns are the spontaneous that, uh, patterns that are generated in, in, in any uh, cortical uh, network system without, uh, or in the absence of external stimuli or any task, any specific task. This is just to remind you that uh, most of the results that I'm going to present to you come from simulations based on models which are probably wrong. I hope that some of them may, might be useful for you. And at least we start a discussion like we're having now to try to improve the models. So that's a I mean, statement of humility. We have to be always aware that our models are really, really simple and wrong. That they are wrong. The models are always wrong because they are based on simplifications. I mean, this is based because I mean, in the morning session, we had some discussion on, about some models, and there are some there were some elements introduced in models which are obviously wrong in the sense that they don't capture in a rigorous way or in a biophysical way what's going on in nature. But any model can do that. So I mean, I put this just to remind us that. Uh, No? Every... I completely disagree. I completely disagree. I'm sorry, Antonio. I'm... And, and only from the discrepancy between your predictions and the measurements in nature, you learn something. And then you, sh you, need, you see, oh, my model is a bit wrong. I can repair it. And then you make so that remembers the following story. Uh, a kid tell, tells his mother, look, I, I, I spared the five reais because instead of taking the bus, I, I run behind the bus. And the mother answers, oh, bad idea. It was be better to run behind a taxi, a cab, than to have spare 50 reais. <laughs> <laughs> 
because it's very easy to make wrong predictions. And the fact that you make wrong predictions does not tell you anything. You can make right predictions with very simplified model. So that's what we... So, uh, no, uh, my point is philosophical, because this is fancy. I don't like it. So my model, so a statistician says, all models are wrong. Some of them are useful. I, I disagree. We try to do the best we can. So we do, we do simplification. Is all simplification help us understand the world? So it's a, it's a, it's a it's it's your point of view. No, it's your point. I, I still agree that. Uh, if you look at the history of physics, you have lots of examples of wrong predictions that led to theory critical improvements. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, we can interpret that in this different context and agree or disagree, but uh, and the, the, the black body, the, yeah, yeah I, I got it, but the black body radi radiation is an example of a wrong prediction that led to major improvement in, in physical theory, so. Yeah, I don't want to enter into this now because we could, we could be discussed in the, in the evening, but uh, I, I, I agree with the point of view of Christoph. Okay, just to uh, very quickly uh, to remind you what uh, spontaneous act uh, cortical activity are. So they, as I said, there are five of neurons measured in the absence of sensory stimuli or motor behavioral tasks. Usually they are measured in such, such conditions. So uh, uh, in vitro cortical tissue slices or, or cultures, there's a way of separating the cortex from the rest of the brain, like uh, creating cortical slabs. You cut all the connect synaptic connections, only keeping the blood supply, and then you have a kind of isolated cortical slab. Uh, when you are in the anesthesia situation, when you are sleeping, or when you are at, at rest. All of these situations, in a way or another, are called in the literature, uh, or the states that are generated by such situations are called spontaneous. Of course, they're highly, di highly diverse. Uh, any of them would be completely isolated, as I said, but anyway, those are what people call spontaneous, uh, uh, states that would generate spontaneous activity, just to differentiate from situations in which you supply external input. So what are the characteristics of those states uh, as revealed by electrophysiological studies? So in the, for the cases in vitro and in vivo, uh, slow wave sleep and uh, anesthesia. So all the cases apart from the resting state when you're just lying down resting. You, in general, when people, people, what people observe both uh, using, uh, say, LFP measurements or, or, or say, EG measurements or LFP measurements or, or even intracellular recordings is like, uh, slow and high amplitude network oscillations like uh, what is shown here and here as well, and so-called up and down states, neuronal states. Up and down states are like here. So you have a, 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 a stable, um, I mean not stable, but a long duration um, depolarized states that are intercalated with also uh, variable duration uh, hyperpolarized states, I mean oscillations between depolarized and hyperpolarized states. Uh, that take that last for the duration of the spontaneous spontaneous situation, and on top of the depolarized states, you have spikes. So the voltages of the neurons, even this is single neuron measurements, the voltage of each single neuron, they oscillate between so-called up state and down state. Uh, you can see here the distribution of the voltage values for a population of cells in one of those uh, spontaneous situations. So they, that is a bimodal distribution. And uh, when uh, the individual or the subject is at the resting state, you have fast and low and amplitude network oscillations, and the uh, neural on firing is irregular. So these are generic features that people observe, and you find that in the literature. So the question is, since you have uh, the same cortical system can generate both oscillatory or so-called synchronized in some uh, areas, and, or constant or desynchronized, according to some authors, population activity patterns, how can the same system go from one state to the other one? How can it generate this uh, 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 bi-stability, if you want? And what are the mechanisms behind the, the, uh, the occurrence of up and down states during the so-called synchronized state, during the oscillatory states? So these are questions that I'm trying to address in our um, work there in Ribeirão Preto. So very quickly now, because I don't want to give a review, but what most people have done in the past is to use what I call classical model, classical in the sense of neuroscience. So it's a, what people call random network. It's an edus rheny graph with 80% of them being excitatory neurons, 20% inhibitory neurons, sparse connectivity, 
the popular leaky integrated and fire deterministic uh, neural model. And uh, the uh, change from sync to the sync, synchrony to the syn synchronized to desynchronized state depends on the ratio of the inhibitory synaptic strength to the excitatory synaptic strength. So this is one of the key parameters, the ratio of the uh, inhibitory synaptic increments to the excitatory synaptic increments. There's background external input applied to neurons modeled in, in diverse way, Parson, noise, or whatever, uh, c constant currents, or all kinds of external input that people model. Uh, and to obtain up and down states, uh, usually what people uh, use is some adaptive current, which have to be, has to be added to the leaf neurons. So you either add some adaptive term that to simulate the effect of uh, 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 downward uh, currents, uh, the, 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 the currents that leave the, 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 the cell uh, interior to the outside, uh, like potassium currents, uh, or one has to use a different type of model that captures that. Or then using external input fluctuations, like input fluctuations that uh, m control the system and make it uh, jump from an up to a down state, like a pacemaker neuron. Uh, of course, I'm not considering here model models based on the hodgkin huxley type neurons or conductance based, which uh, then re use uh, conductances and all kinds of uh, ionic currents. I'm only concerning a so-called simplified neural models. So two examples of those so-called classical models is the famous Brunel paper has been a model that has been mentioned here today. So it's, uh, it's not an erdos renyi because it has fixed degree, fixed in degree, as Rodrigo explained. I, I, sorry, I won't have time here to explain it. But what Brunel did was to, besides some uh, analytical work, he did a uh, uh, classification of um, the states that such a model generates. And uh, based on the ratio between inhibitory synaptic strength and excitation synaptic strength plot plotted in this axis here, and the level of, of external input noise, the system can have uh, different states that were classified as, uh, say, synchronous regular. The first uh, synchronous and asynchronous refer always to the network, to the collective behavior. So the collective behavior could be either synchronous, all the cells are more or less firing in synchrony, or they, you have a kind of constant, as, as Brunel said, a kind of constant output, like uh, here, for example. Uh, no, sorry, uh, kind of uh, non synchronous Yeah, this is a kind of uh, non-oscillatory, or, or, or here as well. You see that there's some situations. Yeah, like here, for example. This is an AI. Yeah. Brunel did, don't use any measure. This is a criticism I have to him. He, does, he didn't use any measure to classify, just by eye. If you look at his paper, he doesn't use any quantitative measure to classify whether the state is synchronized or not. And even experimental neurologists, they only classify by saying, this is the synchronized or synchronized, which is a rather vague way of classifying. That's one of my criticisms to this. So basically, they, and people are looking for this AI, so-called asynchronous irregular state, which uh, uh, is claimed to be the default state when you are in awake resting state, uh, which is a state like this. So you are, you have. A, so the first, as I said, the first is comp is relative to the collect to the collective behavior, and the second one refers to the individual cell behavior. So cells can fire either regularly or irregularly. Like uh, if every cell, like here, is a regular spiking, all the cells are more or less firing in a regular way. So you see that uh, the Russell plot has those bands here, more or less aligned. If they are irregular, you have something that uh, at this, at the, you take a single line here and see that the spikes do not follow any particular, uh, say, rule no? or, or scheme. Uh, OK, so this is another example for, for, for Gilles and Abbott, another classic work. So what we want to do there uh, here in Neuromat is to go beyond the classical model. So we want to consider networks with, a, say, more realistic and uh, inverted comma architectures. We want to consider more realistic neural models and other types of noise apart from those, that Poisson type noise that people usually apply to neurons. So just to have a, a, a give an overview, so what we mean by more realistic network ar architecture. So we can go to microscopic level and consider, say, networks would capture in detail the microscopic structure of the connections at locally at the cortex, or models that capture the overall, the global, the microscopic structure of connections between areas in the cortex. When we want to, say, use more realistic neurons, we want to have neurons that, uh, uh, neural models that capture the different spiking behaviors that uh, cortical neurons display. There are different uh, types of cortical behaviors, and there are models that uh, are able to do that. Uh, and we hope also to fit the GL model to, rep to reproduce this type of model. And the sources of noise, there are 
lots of sources of noise. Here are only some of them. I took this slide from Benjamin Linda. So there's an intrinsic channel noise. I think Rodrigo has reviewed this. I want to very briefly go through it. So in intrinsic channel noise. Uh, also unreliable synapses, so the release of synaptic um, vesicles when there is a spike, or even without spikes, presynaptic pre spikes uh, occur uh, constantly, and this uh, because of the quantized nature of the of the neurotransmitters and, and the package of neurotransmitters within each vesicle introduce some stochasticity at the synaptic level, and then the famous <laughs> network noise, whatever it is, no. Uh, Kind of, as here it says, like a quasi-random input from any weakly correlated neuron. So you imagine that a single cell is embedded in a network which generates this chaotic-like behavior, which is also part of what people call noise. A more recent classic, I should say that, if you permit, is the model by Pochens and Disma. So it goes beyond. It, it, so it's uh, according to the right path, uh, as according to my scheme. So it, uh, they generalized the Brunel model by using a network with a, a very detailed and realistic uh, connectivity at the local level, at the cortical local level. So they, they still have 80% of the cells being excitatory, 20% of them being inhibitory. The model uh, corresponds to a, a column. It's not a, a column in the sense that it's a functional unit. It's just a local column in the cortex uh, chosen to have one millimeter of uh, surface area. Uh, and then it's divided in four layers uh, and uh, has uh, about uh, 100,000 neurons, 10 to the ninth synapses. They still use the leaf neuron, as has been explained by Marcus in his talk. All of them, the two identical, so the excitatory and inhibitory cells are identical in the original model. But by simulating this, uh, they obtained uh, a synchronous irregular activity, as, as Brunel did for the proper balance in the balanced state when G, yeah, I, I didn't say that, but uh, if, you sh if you look at the, the diagram by Brunel, when the, the ratio between excitatory and to synaptic, ratio between inhibitory to excitatory synaptic increments is four. In the case where you have identical neurons, so equal uh, firing rate for all cells, since there are four times more excitatory cells than uh, inhibitory cells, when G is e exactly equal to four, I think Ozami can say something <laughs> about that later, for the, yeah, four minus epsilon for the Galvez and Lochebar model, but for the leak integrated and fire deterministic is four, ex exactly four. You have so called balanced state. Uh, I don't have time now to go into this, but you have this state, and for this state, you have a synchronous irregular activity, as you can see here. Uh, although you have to introduce by hand some extra uh, increments in the synaptic conductances to have, uh, because if you really mo model it as we did, you observe some oscillations, and even at the original Brunel model. So this is another thing that people usually don't say when they publish papers. They, they say that the model is a strictly a synchronous irregular, so there's no oscillations. But if you look at the model, you run it, you see some oscillations. <laughs> OK, but anyway. And it reproduces the spike rates across layer in a proper way. So this is a, say, a kind of classic model on which you have to uh, work on, on top of it. So what are we doing there in Hibiron Preto and here at Neuromat? So we are considering at the neuron level, single neuron level, we are considering networks uh, which are, say, more realistic or try to capture more, more uh, effects. So we are using two-dimensional leak integrated fire type neurons. So integrated fire in the sense that they have a threshold and a, a, a spike and reset rule, but they are two-dimensional. They have a second variable, which uh, uh, usually was uh, considered to model um, adaptation. Now it's, it's called a recovery variable because depending on the parameters, you can model more uh, phenomena than just adaptation. The two most famous examples of this type of neuron are the Zikevich neuron, which use, uh, I should say, how here also non-linear, the two-dimensional non-linear, because the, in the original LIF model, they have a, a, a linear term. To, uh, the voltage, uh, dv dt, c dv dt go ma, equal minus v. Here you have a, a non-linear term there. In the case of Zikevich, it's a quadratic term in the case of the so-called um, adaptive exponential element is exponential. The nonlinearity is exponential, uh, are similar. So we are considering the two types of neurons, which are deterministic. And then we are considering stochastic neurons in two fashions, uh, using the GL model, so uh, uh, probability of firing, phi of V. Uh, so the model is agnostic to the origin of noise in it. And uh, a deterministic model could be one of those, and also leaf model, plus some stochastic term added to it. So there are two ways of introducing noise. And the idea would be, uh, we're not using those models because we believe in them. Again, 
I stress what I said before. Models are wrong, but models can generate predictions that we can compare. And we want to, so to compare the predictions generated by the, the, the different type of models. Uh, well, I, I would say something, but now I, I think it's better to skip it. So at the synaptic level, we're using a very basic synaptic model, just instantaneous increments in the synaptic conductance followed by an exponential decay. Of course, there are better models. And, the, and we know that depending on the type of synaptic model you use, you get different results. You can have so-called current-based models in which you have ins, uh, instantaneous increments in the current whenever there's a presynaptic spike, or you have a, uh, uh, you have a time-varying conductance after some presynaptic spike, we generate some uh, increments in the voltage of the postsynaptic neurons. But we are not using those. We're just considering instantaneous increments. We also want to, of course, to introduce synaptic plasticity because, as, as I said, this is the ultimate goal. Uh, there's only one game in town, it's synaptic plasticity. What we're doing here is something just uh, marginal to it. But we haven't yet entered in this. Uh, of course, I, actually, I have done some work on synaptic plasticity in my life Time in my life before neuromat, but this is some uh, prehistoric thing. So I, I want to come back to it in the neuromat context. And regarding the structure of the network, so-called network graph, we are considering so networks with the Erdos Renier topology, like uh, in the original Brunel model. We are, we are considering networks with a so-called hierarchical modular structure, which somehow captures the overall structure of connections in the, the, in the macroscopic way in the cortex. And we are doing this using a very artificial in a, a way of constructing a, a, a artificial and a hierarchical and modular net network. I don't have time here to go into it, but it's a very artificial one, but you generate a network which has hierarchy and modules as well. And also we are considering uh, the cortical microcircuit uh, graph introduced by Porchens and Dismond. So we are considering all types of, uh, all di di different types of uh, network graphs. And the idea, as I said, is to compare what each module generates, okay? So, so far, I mean, I had a life before neuromat, as I said, and I couldn't stop it when I entered neuromat. So we are doing work along these lines before I entered into neuromat and even before the same lab existed. Most of it uh, regarding the simplified models that I mentioned is based on a collaboration between my laboratory there in Ribeirão Preto and collaborators from Germany, Sao Paulo state funding from the Brazilian side and the FG fund, fund from the German side, involved collaboration with people from the Humboldt University. Uh, and from Brazil is basically Rodrigo Pena, now Fernanda also may be involved. So here are some recent papers, curiously only in the even numbered years. And what we basically studied here is uh, networks of two-dimensional nonlinear leak integrating fire type models, uh, deterministic or with uh, we, what we call synaptic noise, but I put that in between inverted commas after the discussion we had today because it's just an, an a, 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 Fancy way of saying that we, we added some noise to the equations there. And uh, we use the, the hierarchical modular graph artificially constructed, uh, or, or also the Edus Rini graph. So the base, uh, Rodrigo has presented some results, but I'll just go bri very briefly about the results that we have obtained, some of them already in the context of neuromat, especially considering synaptic noise. So this is our new diagram. So the <laughs> It's not classical yet, probably will never be. But anyway, this, compare this please with the diagram shown by Brunel. So this is our diagram. We also have here in this axis, the ratio between inhibitory to excitatory synaptic increments. And here the a measure of the synaptic noise, or noise if you want, just a measure of the external noisy input. So you see that uh, the, different, the, the, the diagram is more complex, more complicated than the one for Brunel, as expected because the neuron model used is more complicated. Uh, so, and we, uh, now back to your question. In, in our work, we, we chose to, it's not shown here, I recommend that you use the, to read the paper, but we chose two measures to classify, one of them will classify uh, the level of oscillatory activity. So we are using what people call spectral entropy. It's an entropic measure. So you take the power spectrum, you normalize it, and then you use the formula by Shannon to calculate the entropy. So if you have a broadband spectrum, you have a high entropy, and the, the variable is normalized to one. So you have a, just a single frequency there, you have um, a low entropy measure. So we have a measure of oscillatory activity. So we are not using the terminology introduced by Brunel because we, we, our measures don't, don't allow us to do that. We, have only, we can only say that we have oscillatory or non-oscillatory 
activity states. And then we used a synchrony measure. We took in the, from the literature a synchrony measure based on the, uh, the, 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 the differences between the, the, the phases of the voltage between uh, uh, samples of cells from the, from the network. As, what's the, I forgot now the name of it, PLV. Phase, phase, yeah, phase, phase locking yeah, value is a value is a measure that's usually considered that. So this classifies the uh, state of synchrony in the network. So based on the two measures, we obtain this diagram here, which is not precise. I mean, the lines here are more or less taken from a visual inspection of. Uh, we run several simulations for several different values in this. Uh, diagram here, and then for each one of them, we, we took the two measures and we classified them. And based on that, we, we got this diagram here. So you see that in the noiseless regime, this is uh, no noise, uh, the type of uh, activity that we have is asynchronous and non-oscillatory, of the types that could be called AI, according to Brunel's terminology. And uh, if you, so, 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 sorry, no, I mean, this is for a little bit noise. The line here at the noiseless is different. The, the line here for the noiseless case has oscillations. So I just uh, was advancing something. For this case here, we have oscillatory state. For this one, we have a different one, an AI-like. And for, for, for this one, you have, one can have different types of behavior. Uh, for the, uh, we, we studied the system in three different points in this diagram. One for the noiseless case, all of them in the case for uh, strong, for high uh, inhibitory synaptic increments. In this case, we cannot say that this is of course, it's a, it's a regime dominated by inhibition, but uh, there's no. Uh, it's difficult to determine the balance point for this for for, for, for for this case because the firing rates are different. Sorry. Yeah, for, for Brunel, the balance was at four because they had uh, uh, the model was uniform. All the so both neural models were sim were the same, and since the ratio between them is four to one. G equals to four gave the balance. In our case, no. In our case, I think the balance would be somehow around here, around two, but we didn't determine it because in our model, we studied this with different combinations of, of cell types. We have fast spike inhibitory cells, uh, bursting excitatory cells, and also regular spiking excitatory cells. So it's more difficult to determine it, to calculate it. I guess it's just based on simulations, no? I think Rodrigo can help me. We did simulations for different values here, and more or less around this region here, we obtained a, a transition from, say, a synchronous non oscillatory to uh, what you call that transition state. So, more or less around that region, there's a. We, can, we still have to do this. It's something that uh, unfinished business. We have to determine a better diagram. Anyway, we studied in this, in this regime here, in this point here, so 6.7, close to 7, which is an inhibition dominated regime, just to have an idea of what the system can do. And we said it in two different situations. Noiseless case, weak noise, and moderate noise. So for the noiseless case, noiseless case, what we have is, of course, transient uh, activity because there's no external input. Right? We only uh, applied external input at the beginning, and then we let the system evolve by itself. We did stimulations for different sets of parameters, different initial conditions. And in all of them, we had oscillatory activity, like you can see here in the Russell plot transient patterns, but very interestingly, we obtained, if you look at the vote, this is the average voted for all the simulations that we did. Uh, and this is a single neuron example. So you, you have, we had in this, in, in this situation, up states and down states. There are states which are depolarized and states that are hyperpolarized in that very in, in, in oscillatory way. And you see the average vote and the distribution. So the system more or less is, is hovering around a, a depolarized state and hyperpolarized state, as you can see here. Of course, it's not perfect. The model was not fit to reproduce up and down states. It's very regular. So people who know about up and down states will say that they have irregularity here. But of course, this is noiseless. So here you see the distribution of durations and so on. So when you add a little bit of noise to the model, you know the noise model because Rodrigo will explain that to you, you have a dramatic change in the behavior. Now, uh, the Russell plot is no longer oscillatory. I mean, there's some oscillatory. Of course, there's always some degree of oscillation in the system. But now, the, vote, the, the histogram of voltage values uh, uh, has a unimodal distribution and center around the resting voltage value. So the model has a resting value to which uh, uh, it decays, each neuron decays after spike. 
So the, 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 the activity here is more or less uh, asynchronous and irregular, similar to what Brunel called asynchronous irregular in his model. So noise has some effect on the model. Whatever noise type is asynchronous. But noise, when you add it, you change completely the distribution of voltage values in the, in the model. And then when you increase noise a little bit, you go to, say, moderate noise level. You have intermittence between oscillatory states, when the oscillations are, are from up and down states, to what we call quiescent states. And you see that, looking at the Russell plot, they look similar. What we call quiescent state is similar to what we call a down state. But if you look at the voltage values, the average voltage values for the, for the, the situations, you see they are not the same. So the average voltage value during the quiescent state is, is hovering around, the, uh, is, 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 the average voltage is the resting voltage, minus 70. Degrees. And the average voltage in the down state is a, is a hyperpolarized voltage, below, uh, below um, under the, the, the resting voltage. And you also have oscillations from uh, up and down. So, I think we can have two regimes here. One is quiescent state, another one is oscillations between up and down states. Uh, so, and it, they, they change from one state, from one regime, to, from one firing regime to another one in an intermittent way. Increasing the noise level even further, what we have observed is that uh, noise destroys uh, the, uh, 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 or reduces the duration, uh, the average duration of the quiescent states. So they kind of favor the active, we call this active state. The oscillatory state is the active state. So noise favors the active state. So if you have that uh, point in the parameter range, uh, G injects, you have uh, uh, noise increases will lead to, to a purely up and down regime of oscillations. So I, see, I only to show to you, only, we, we, we did not do only simulations. We, we try to explain of course, the model is very complicated. It's very high dimension. It's more than 1,000 neurons. But uh, we, we were able to, at least to, in a mathematical way, uh, depict what is going on there. Probably you can have another meeting here, and I can explain this to you. I don't have, but based, uh, just idea, uh, you have, a, we kind of identify the, what we call hole in the high dimension of phase space for the system, uh, where the likelihood that the, the system uh, goes to rest in state in the noiseless case is higher than in the other part of the diagram. And uh, when you have noise, uh, what happens is that the system, instead of going to the resting state, goes to that uh, quiescent state. And the role of noise is to make the system exit. If you increase noise a little bit, you make the system exit the quiescent state and go into the oscillatory state. So we explain this by using a combination of a representation of the global phase space for the entire system based on the average value of the voltage, va voltage value and the recovery variable, and also on the single neuron, uh, using the single neuron two-dimensional diagram based on, on the voltage and the U variable. Uh, also, we studied networks with modularity. As I said, we had this hierarchical modular structure, and uh, basically the main result is that uh, modularity increases the duration, the lifetime of the activity in the network. This is for the noiseless setup. No, with uh, the noise setup, as I told you before, all the uh, states are transient. They eventually decay to rest. But if you have modules, this is the case only for four modules, what you have is that uh, you have an increase in the lifetime of, of the activity there. This, uh, you can see here, if, say, if two modules which are topologically closer, because in the way we created this artificial hierarchical modular network is that we start with a big uh, edus rene type network, and then we divide, and then we divide, and so on. I explained that in Leiden to you uh, two years uh, a year. And so there are, there are modules which clo are topologically closer to each other than other modules. And each, at each new hierarchical level, you create a new, uh, say, group of modules which are more distant than the original ones. So because of that, the connections are weaker from, say, modules which are topologically closer to modules which are more distant from, from, from them. And the activities became more decorrelated. And this the decorrelation causes a longer lifetime. And of course, it uh, causes oscillations in the model. That, that's why probably I, I asked to you this morning that uh, that uh, uh, kind of uh, high power that you have in the, in the gamma band, they may be generated by the modularity that you have in your model. They, that may be an artifact. I don't know, one has to investigate that. But the prediction based on this model would be that, that since you have modules, you have probably to adjust some parameters to, to avoid this high power that you have in the gamma. Anyway. Let's carry on. So here's a resume of the main findings that we had so far based on this line of research. 
uh, we can say that uh, I didn't explain, but uh, we, we were able to show that the up and down oscillations are caused by the, uh, the negative feedback mechanism that's generated or introduced into the model by the addition of the recovery variable. So when um, the prediction is that for any, any network that uses uh, a two-dimensional uh, single neural model it has a recovery variable, uh, uh, this, the, this, this would lead to an up and down oscillation. So the up and down oscillations are like a de default mode of activity that you have in this in this uh, uh, network. So a noise is not uh, is not necessary to create up and down oscillations. As you can see, we obtain oscillations even in the noiseless case. The role of noise, at least in our model, is just to make the system go from the quiescent state to uh, the oscillatory state. And again, as I said, modularity extends the average lifetime of the transient states. Now to some work in progress, just to show you that we're doing more things. So we have plans to study the same type of uh, problem that we're uh, studying here using the Porchens and Dismond graph. So the, the graph of the model created or proposed or introduced by, by, by Dismond and Porchens, uh, but using, uh, instead of the leak integrate and fire model that they used, different neuron types. The two-dimensional non-linear leak integrate and fire models that I mentioned to you, and stochastic neurons. To, uh, again, study the differences in the behavior that you have there and see, uh, I mean, uh, the improvements or, or uh, the decrements that you can have in the quality of the model in comparison to experiments. This is being done by, by my students there in Ribeirão Preto and postdocs. Uh, so far, we don't have any paper to show to you. I hope that uh, next year we can have them. Uh, where is Newton? Yeah. Uh, and the other guys as well. What we have is some posters presented in conferences. So we try to do, to use the GL model in the Porchens Dismond uh, context. And then to comp and when we generated uh, activity, we had, a, we, we fitted from the original leak integrated fire model used by, by Dismond uh, and Porchens, uh, a GL model that reproduces the, the average behavior. And then based on this fitted uh, uh, stochastic model, we, we, we run simulations uh, we obtained uh, similar results to the original one by, by Porchens and Dismond. Of course, it's difficult to see here, but this is still uh, unfinished work. We still have to Im improve the model. Uh, then we also did the same graph to study uh, networks populated by uh, Izikevich neurons, which are two-dimensional non-linear integrated fire models, and obtain also the uh, activity in those cells. So the idea is to compare all the models. Also, we are doing... Uh, this is mostly work by Renan, who is in Ulish now. Uh, models in which we vary the, uh, the relative inhibition in the model. So this is the, the ratio between G and GX. So we can control this parameter here. And also control, this is with the ADEX model, not the EZKF. This is uh, a, the, uh, the second type of uh, two-dimensional non-linear leak integrated fire model that we use. And here, in the model, there's a parameter which uh, recovery of the uh, or the reset of the recovery variable after a spike. After a spike, you reset not only the voltage, but you also reset the recovery, or you increment the recovery variable by a, a small value. It's called B, you cannot see here, but you, at each new spike, you increment a little bit, a, it, a little bit, which causes a difficulty for the neuron to fire a next spike. So this implements a spike rate adaptation. So if you increase, Along, if you go along this direction, you increase the spike rate adaptation. If you go along this direction, you increase the relative inhibition. And here is the power, uh, examples of power spikes are calculated for the network. And you see that you, uh, there are some uh, power in the gamma bands that appear when you uh, go in the... Uh, uh, I mean, if, if you have weak inhibition, you have those high gammas here. If for, for strong inhibition, they disappear, the, the spectrum the spectra become more or less flat. And also, if you uh, reduce adaptation, you have the appearance of this phenomena. So this is to model the effect of acetylcholine in the, in, in the network. It's known that acetylcholine has some effect on the adaptation, spike rate adaptation. So the idea is to model that. We are working on this uh, there, uh, probably using a better model. So this is only to show you that we're having this type of uh, study, that we're doing this type of study. And as Rodrigo presented to you, this is, has been shown to you before, we are... Uh, trying to do what Brunel did with the GL neurons. So the idea is to take the original graph of the Brunel network. So it's not a Nedus-Renis, it's a random network with fixed degree. Uh, 
as they used there. So the same network that Brunel used in his classical model of 2000, and substitute the, the leak integrated phi deterministic models that they have there by a GL neuron. And that case is not a, 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 is, is a GL neuron fitted from the experiments, as Rodrigo explained to you this morning. So we took a time series of voltage, voltage time series from uh, uh, in vitro cells. Uh, this is a problem, Pro probably we'll have to do for in, in vivo ones, but uh, for the moment we have only access to in vitro data. So based on that uh, in vitro data, we fitted, using the scheme that Rodrigo presented to you this morning, uh, a function phi of v for the, uh, this stochastic model, which is uh, after the data was uh, obtained, we used this uh, sigmoidal function here to fit the data. So you see there's a parameter here, k, which controls the, the shape of the firing function. So uh, for, for large k, you have a hard threshold similar to deterministic leak integrated and fire. And for uh, small k, you, have a, uh, you increase the slope of the, this, this function. And you see that uh, uh, this point here is for the deterministic case. You, you have oscillations. And this point here is for the stochastic case, uh, high, highly stochastic if you want. You have less. Uh, Rodrigo presented to you this morning, and here's this power spectrum of the activity of the cell, of, of the sorry, of the network, and you also see that in the high range here, you have low uh, power, as Rodrigo has presented. So stochasticity reduces high frequency oscillatory activity, which is interesting because this was obtained in the context of a network with a random graph, a randomly type graph, and compare this with the yeah, it's Brunel. Yeah, Brunel. Let's call it Brunel. So, in the case of Brunel network, who have so st stochasticity reduces the uh, high frequency oscillations, and in the case of the uh, uh, in that those Edus Rini with conventional uh, leak integrated and fine neurons plus what we call synaptic noise, we also had uh, a case in which the noiseless setup. We had oscillations, and then that a little bit of noise, we jumped into a situation in which you have AI activity, more or less constant. So in our situation as well, sorry. Ah, okay. So in our in, in a different for a different model, different neural type, different network structure, we also observe the same phenomena. The same phenomenon: stochasticity reduces the occurrence of oscillations in the model. Of course, I don't know what this means, but there is something that uh, uh, was observed. But then this raises questions. I, I put this slide this morning after discussing to Marco. So there is always some noise in any system, even in the isolated cortical tissue. It's like you have noise, but we observe oscillatory activity in the noiseless case. So they, this might be an artifact. But you see, this is an artifact not, not only of the uh, two-dimensional nonlinear leak integrated fire model, but also of the uh, stochastic model that we use because we had some oscillatory activity there. Um, so anyway, this, this might, is it an artifact of the, of the lack of noise? Sorry, I'm probably I'm wrong when I said uh, In the noiseless case, you have oscillations. So perhaps the oscillatory activity is just an artifact of not having noise there. Yeah, I think that's, that's, the, that's the mess. I don't know. So this is some question that has to be studied. And another one is, how can we improve synaptic noise model? Of course, I know that the model is probably wrong. Um, in that sense, wrong. I think we have, I know in the literature there are better models. We have uh, to discuss whether a binomial or a Poisson approximation to be a better one. But anyway, there, there are attempts there, there in the literature, uh, possible models that we can use and compare. How the model with added, uh, added noise compares to the GL model, which is a model in which the synapse is introduced via that intensity function. How, what's the difference between them? Can we fit the GL model to reproduce with the behavior observed with the models with added noise? If so, probably the GL model would be, say, uh, less expensive to be implemented in a simulation. So I, I don't know. So there, there are lots of open questions. And the idea is to use events like this for us to discuss, for the students especially to discuss, the simulators and the mathematicians. Uh, and the analyticers uh, to, to, to talk and then try to improve the models. I think there's another one which is just, I uh, don't know whether extrapolated, but that's the message. So we're, we're, the message is we're trying to 
uh, adapt what I was doing before to the context of Neuromat. But also try to put, to give to people from Neuromat problems to work on as well. So the, the idea is let's try and investigate spontaneous activity phenomena in the brain. And then try to study plasticity phenomena. How can we model this type, of this, the phenomena that I observed in the context of spontaneous activity states using all the tools that uh, people from Neuromat have at their disposal? That's the that's the that's the the challenge that I pose to you. And interacting with us, we probably can produce better models. Okay, thank you. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, we'll have a break and then a discussion afterwards. But if you want to discuss this, I mean, initially there were some that were okay. Sunny and Tolkien, but I don't know where. Do you want to do that or not? No? So far, we can have a. If no one has questions, we can have a, a, a coffee break now and then we'll resume in half an hour. And then we'll have the entire. We can return, yeah, if you want, yeah. The idea would be to return, yeah, because the this final part of the afternoon is to discuss the future of the scene lab. So of course, the future of scene lab has very much to do with I talked. Of course, people are invited to present the, the, the slides, as Marcus has said. But yeah, we are here to discuss what you, we, uh, you suggest to us to do, and also what we suggest that we should do in this interaction. What I'd like to do is to yeah. take Marcus' method and to help the first comment. Because I, I guess in your text, you changed the, the focus. So I'd like to return to this point. And well, I have also small comments. Could you please get one slide back? Is there someone there? Is there someone there? Yes, so, uh, so questions like this, these are trivial questions. This is not a question. This is an exercise of probability. So uh, it's good to put it here. If you could have this interaction more often, so it's like say, the GL model is an integrated unifier model with random threshold. It's, it's not a question, it's just an exercise. So this is a this question, so it's not a question. So it's just a, a problem of language communication. But what Marx put is more, uh, is more crucial to us. Uh, I, has an, I, have, I, I want to use something else that Marx told us, I guess, in, in October. And I asked him, uh, Marcus, take into account to have all the simulations. So I, I will be in the position of a, a non mathematician neuroscientist. Why do I need mathematicians if I can see all these wonderful simulations? And you told me something, I would like to, 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 to pick this point. So 